Well, Happy New Year. I'd invite you at this time to please turn in your copy of God's Word to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. This morning, as we continue our life-changing look at the life of Christ, we're going to continue by looking at Luke chapter 2, verses 40 through 52. This is the account of Jesus traveling down as a boy to the temple and his mom and dad leaving him there, going home on accident and having to go find him. This will be this morning. Before I read these words, though, let's go ahead and look to God in a time of prayer, asking his blessing. This morning, our prayer is outlined by Psalm 19. Let's pray. Father, you tell us that your word is perfect, that it revives the soul, meaning our souls need reviving, that the testimony, your testimony is sure, we can count on it, that it makes the simple-minded wise. We're told that your precepts are right, that they are cause for our hearts to rejoice, that your commandments are pure, that that is what enlightens our eyes, that your word is clean, that it endures forever, that it never ends, that your laws and statutes are true and righteous altogether. They alone are to be desired more than gold, that they are sweeter than honey. So, Father, now it is to your word we look. May you not disappoint. May you allow the words of my mouth as the preacher and the meditation of all of our hearts to be pleasing and acceptable in your sight now. For you are our Lord God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. This morning we're going to find Jesus as a 12-year-old boy. So far we've only talked to him about as the eternal word, the eternal God. We've seen him as a baby in, uh, yet to be born in Mary's womb. And we saw him a couple of weeks ago, the Sunday before Christmas, being delivered there and placed in a feeding trough. Last week we saw Magi from the east come and visit him and worship him and give him gifts him being a few months old or as many as two years old at that point. And now the Bible skips ahead to age 12. And what I want to do to help our minds kind of grasp what's transpired so far in Jesus' life is give us just kind of a visual review. And one of the ways I love to review and just keep track of Jesus and where he's been and where he's at now is with our handy dandy map that I taught you how to draw about a month ago. And so this morning we get to draw our map once again and show you where Jesus has been and where he is today, so to speak, and where we find him in our chapter here in Luke. Of course, we all know how to draw Israel now. It's pretty simple, really. That's it. Remember that. And recall that this is over here, this blue body, a body of water called the Mediterranean Sea. And there are a couple other significant water bodies in the country of Israel. We'll put those in real quick to get our bearings. One is the Sea of Galilee, that big blue blob right there. And then we have a long blue blob down below. That's called the Dead Sea. There is another body of water that connects these two things. It's the Jordan River, and it kind of flows from north to south there between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea. There's a couple of key cities that we need to make sure that we put on our map this morning because uh, they are uh, the points, this, the waypoints through which Jesus and his family travel. Let's do start with the one up north, the one in the region of Galilee, by the Sea of Galilee. It's where Mary was from and where Jesus spent most of his childhood. It's Nazareth. Remember that little dot up there in the north. I'm going to put an N here. So we can remember that that is Nazareth. 
Now, if you travel south in Israel, about 85 miles, a journey Jesus and his family had to do quite often, you got to Jerusalem. That's this dot down here. That's in the region of Judea. Let me put a J above that, just so we can remember that that is Jerusalem. Five or six miles south of Jerusalem is Bethlehem. So we got our B there. These are all areas that we've already put on our map. This morning we're going to add an area. It's one that's not unfamiliar to any of us. It's the country of Egypt. And I can't draw the whole country, but what I can do is put an E down here to let you know that's about where Egypt is on this map. Okay? So what have we learned? We learned that while Mary was in Nazareth, up there at the end, the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you're going to have a baby. She traveled down, she saw her cousin Elizabeth, and she went back up to Nazareth. But then, just before she gave birth, her and Joseph, they traveled down to Bethlehem. So let me just put kind of a line down here to Bethlehem, and I'll put an arrow so you know which way they traveled. Jesus was born then, as they were there in Bethlehem. It's there in the days immediately after Jesus was born that the shepherds who were out in their fields watching the flock by night came and visited Jesus, and they worshipped him. A few weeks later, when Jesus was 40 days old, to be exact, Joseph and Mary packed up baby Jesus, and they traveled up to Jerusalem. Why? Because in the Old Testament, way back in the book of Exodus, God told Moses that all the firstborn sons of Israel needed to be dedicated, set apart to the Lord. This had to do all the way back to the time of Passover. Do you remember when all the plagues were hitting Egypt? The last plague was God was going to kill the firstborn son and the firstborn of any animal that had been born in their flocks. That is, unless, of course, the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb, was found on their doorpost, then that Passover, the death, or I'm sorry, the angel of death would pass by their door, and their sons and their firstborn cattle and all their other barnyard animals would remain alive. Well, ever since that time, the sons of Israel, when they were the firstborn sons, all had to be taken to the temple to be consecrated or devoted to the Lord. And Jesus, because he fulfilled the law, when he was 40 days old, he was taken to the temple. That way they could check off that he had fulfilled this part of the law. You can read about this earlier in Luke chapter 2. We haven't talked about it much. We've only mentioned it in passing. Now, after this took place, Joseph and Mary took their baby, their bundle of joy, and they went, oh, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Hold on. They went back from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Why did they go back to Bethlehem? Well, we don't know for sure. Joseph probably had family there. But it's while they were there in Bethlehem that we found them living in a house and the Magi that we learned about last week from Persia and Babylonia, modern-day Iraq and Iran, came and visited Jesus and worshipped him. It's also during this time that King Herod wanted to kill Jesus. And so God warned Joseph to take Mary and Jesus and flee to Egypt to escape Herod. And so you have Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. Oh, I keep erasing stuff. Sorry about that. I, here we go. They flee to Egypt. And they are saved from the murderous Herod. How long were they in Egypt for? It wasn't very long. We know that Jesus was most likely born between 6 and 4 B.C. And King Herod died in 4 B.C. And when King Herod died... The Lord once again told Joseph it was safe to go back to Israel. But Joseph knew that Herod's son was reigning there in Jerusalem in that area of Judea. So rather than going back to Bethlehem at this point, they traveled all the way up to Nazareth. 
And that's where Jesus spent much of his childhood. This is why he could be called a Nazarene. This is also why it could be said that of Jesus, that out of Egypt, he had called his son. And so God fulfilled all of these prophecies, these detailed prophecies in his son, Jesus. None of them went unfulfilled. Now, I'm going to change color here right now simply because we've gotten to today's text. We don't learn of anything about Jesus from the time he's two years old to the time he's 12. But now that he's 12, we find him and his family traveling once again. This time, this time, sorry, they just keep disappearing on me. This time, he travels back to Jerusalem with his family. I'm not very good at this. Back to his family, or back to Jerusalem with his family, so that way they could celebrate the Passover festival. It would have lasted a little longer than a week. That first day they celebrated Passover, they would have killed a lamb, an unblemished lamb. They would have eaten the whole thing. Anything that they could not have eaten, they would have burned, not kept till morning. And then they would have went into a week-long celebration known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. At the end of that time, Jesus and his family started traveling. Well, it wasn't Jesus at this point. Joseph and Mary start traveling back to Nazareth. And when they find out, they realize, hey, we forgot Jesus. All right, so that's where we found him. That's our map. You guys are all up to date. Oh, this is where we find Jesus. You guys can take this off right now if you want to. I'm going to take it off of my, I'm going to stop mirroring. This is where we find Jesus and his family. We know, based on a couple of different Old Testament texts, one coming from Exodus chapter 23, verses 14 and 17, the other one, Deuteronomy 16, 16, that every male, adult male, and at this point it applied to Joseph, Jesus' dad, that they had to go, they had to travel to Jerusalem three times a year. The Old Testament law required them to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of Passover, Pentecost, and booths or tabernacles. The women, they were allowed to go, they were welcome to go, but they were not required to go. You see, by the time Jesus was born, Israel had just been spread out, the Jews had been spread out all over the place for lots of reasons. And so making it back to Jerusalem three times in a year got rather difficult for these people that were spread out all over the known world at that point. So oftentimes they would not fulfill God's law. They would not go three times. Sometimes they would go twice. Sometimes they would only go once. There were those that obviously didn't make the trip at all. But according to our text, verse 21, Mary and Joseph, it was their tradition to go to Jerusalem at least once a year for Passover. That's what they're doing here. Did they normally take Jesus on their trip to Jerusalem? We don't know. But we do know, based on this account, that Luke tells us that Jesus is 12 years old. This is very interesting, a very interesting detail. Why? Because the Mishnah, which was basically like a commentary on the Old Testament law, the Mishnah told dads, if you have not been taking your boys down to Jerusalem for these feasts, then you need to take them when they're 11 or 12 years old. And the reason is because next year when they're 13, they're going to be considered a man by Jewish custom. And they're going to be responsible for going to Jerusalem three times a year. And so you need to get your boys to Jerusalem so that way they know what to do in the coming to these feasts, these celebrations. Now, is this what's happening here with Jesus? It's very possible. It's very possible that Jesus is on a field trip. 
You can only imagine Jesus studying the word of God, learning about Jerusalem, the temple, his father's house, getting to go to Jerusalem on this field trip and see and experience the things that he'd been reading about and learning about in the scriptures. Jesus was excited to be there. Think about your kids when they get to go to the zoo with the school. They get excited. Well, here you have the Son of God getting to go to his father's house. An incredible picture. It's also helpful for us to know this because when I say to know this, to know that there are a lot of people going to Jerusalem during these feasts. You see, what would happen is you'd have huge caravans of people like Joseph and Mary and Jesus and his half-brothers traveling from Nazareth probably would have traveled from everybody with everybody else from Nazareth going down to Jerusalem. You're talking hundreds, sometimes thousands of people traveling together. And that's just from one village. They would link up from the other villages and they would all migrate on the spiritual pilgrimage to Jerusalem and then they would turn around when the festival was over and they would all go back. It was fun. It was festive. There was safety in numbers. It was quite the event. This helps us to understand how in the world Moses, or Moses, <laughs> Joseph and Mary could lose Jesus. You see, what would happen oftentimes is the women and the small children would go out in front. And then the men and the older boys would follow behind. You could easily picture a scenario in which Mary thought Jesus was with dad. And Joseph thought Jesus was with mom. Parents, have you ever been there? Well, I thought it was with you. Well, I thought it was with you. Oh, no, what are we going to do? Enjoy the peace and quiet. No, just kidding. <laughs> it's an easy mistake, one that is very fathomable. It wasn't until the family on their way back to Nazareth had traveled an entire day that they were getting together with friends and family at night that they realized that Jesus was nowhere to be found. And so the very next morning, rather than continuing on with their party, they turned around like a fish swimming upstream and went back to Jerusalem in search of Jesus. They found him the day after that. And he was sitting there at the temple with the teachers. That's the big picture of what's going on in this passage. Now that we're up to date, what I want to do with the rest of our time is I want to key in on two specific details from this text in an effort to bring us some comfort, encouragement, and application. We're actually going to look at six different details from this text in the next couple of weeks. This morning, we're simply going to look at the first two. They will serve as our two points. The first one is this, the humanity of Christ, the humanity of Christ. Our second point, when we get there, will be the wisdom of Christ, the wisdom of Christ. Let's begin with the humanity of Christ. Look at verse 40. And the child, Jesus, grew and he became strong, filled with wisdom. Now jump down to verse 52. It says there that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature. So you have Jesus growing, becoming, and increasing. Now, you might be thinking, Pastor, haven't you told us time and time again that Jesus is God? Well, yes, of course I've told you and taught you that Jesus is God. That's what the scriptures teach. Well, if Jesus is God, if he never changes, if he knows all things, if he is all-powerful, if he is the source of of all wisdom, then why does this text say that Jesus grew? Meaning he developed, he progressed, that he 
became strong. How does the all-powerful one become strong? Because that language denotes that there is, at least for a time, weakness. How could he become filled with wisdom if he's God? Does he not already possess all wisdom? Is he not the source of all wisdom? Verse 52 says that he increased in wisdom and in stature. If we're not careful, these verses do not compute with the idea that Jesus is God. But the truth is, they absolutely compute. If you remember the theological framework, groundwork that we laid at the beginning of this sermon series, and that is that Jesus is, in fact, 100% God. And let me just emphasize that again, because we're not going to emphasize this point throughout the sermon. Jesus is 100% God. He's always been God. He is the eternal Son of God. Of God. But not only is Jesus 100% God, we know that as he was born, he took on human flesh, and the scriptures teach us that he became just like us. He is 100% human. And we actually laid this groundwork for several weeks teaching that God is both fully, that Jesus is both fully God and fully man in one person. These two verses, verses 40 and 52, they seek to give us a glimpse into just how human Jesus really is. Jesus, as he was born, a little baby, who knows if he was six pounder, five pounder, or ten pounder, hopefully he was smaller than bigger. <laughs> But that little baby boy, his body grew and got bigger and bigger and bigger. And just as his human body grew and got bigger, so did his human mind. So did his emotions. So did his intellect. So did his wisdom. Pastor, are, are you saying... That Jesus was born ignorant. I'm not saying stupid here, but am I saying that was Jesus born like you and I are born without knowledge? Are you saying that the God who cast our sins when we trust in him who cast our sins as far as the east is from the west, had to learn the difference between his right hand and his left? Are you suggesting that the eternal word, and remember that's how we classified him from John 1.1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, he was with God in the beginning. Are you suggesting that the eternal word had to learn how to read and write? That the eternal word had to learn his ABCs? Actually, they were the alpha, betas, and the gimels because they were Greek, but you get the point. Is the one who created the whole world. Did he have to learn how to draw a circle? And that one plus one equals two? Are you saying that the author of Scripture needed to read Scripture and study Scripture in order to know the Scriptures? Yes, that is exactly what I am saying. Except I'm not saying it. God, through the gospel of Luke, is telling us this. You see, Jesus, he was not preloaded with a bunch of data. 
an intellect when he was born as a baby. He didn't get to plug into a computer and just download a copy of the KJV. He had to learn it. Jesus had to grow just like we grow. He was 100% human. Too many times we see Jesus and we assume when we hear about his sinlessness or his perfection, oh, well, he's Jesus. He had a free pass. I mean, he's God. No, church, you're not hearing the scriptures right. Yes, he is God. But as we'll learn in just a second, he set that aside to become 100% man. He grew just like us. He grew physically. He grew emotionally. He grew intellectually. He grew in wisdom. He grew in stature, just like you and I have grown. Why? Because he was born of Mary. And when he was, he was born fully man. Philippians 2, 6 and 7, it tells us that he did not consider something, he was God. I'm I'm having a hard time quoting verse 6. But then verse 7 goes on to say that he, in our English translations, it says he emptied himself. A better picture there in my mind is he set aside all of the things that made him God, the priority or the, the, the privileges that he had, the rights that he had as God, somehow, and this is inexplainable to the human mind, he set aside the things that made him God and he instead allowed his life to be fully human. Does that mean that he never tapped into his deity? I don't even like the phrase tap into his deity. He did. But Luke's point And what we need to understand is he became just like us. He was just like us, except he never sinned. He was just like us. He had a mom and dad who made mistakes. We'll see it next week when Mary questions Jesus. And you know what? He never sinned against mom and dad. Jesus never told a lie. He was never selfish. He never said bad words or stole something from the grocery store. He always made the right choice. He loved everyone perfectly. And he always did what God wanted him to do, even as a human. Jesus was 100% human as well as 100% God. Think about this. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 tells us that he had to be made just like his brother's in every respect, just like us. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, we're told that he, is, he was tempted just like us in every way, and yet he was without sin. And this should make us marvel at the greatness of Christ. This should make us say, what an incredible, person, especially when you start to compare Jesus to ourselves. I mean, there's days I feel like I can't go two days without messing up. Wait, two days? I meant to say two minutes. Jesus went a lifetime. Even as an adolescent, even as a little kid, even as a teenager, even as a 20-something, Jesus never broke. He never succumbed 
to temptation. He always lived to do the will of the Father. What a life. Church, we don't begin to grasp the greatness of the God-man, of Christ, our brother and our Lord, until we begin to come to terms with this humanity. If we always just give ourselves an excuse for not doing what is right by saying, well, Jesus had it easy because he was God, then we undermine the scriptures that point to the fact that he was also truly man. What a man he is. Calvin, he writes in his commentary on this passage that there is only this difference between us and him. That the weaknesses which press upon us by a necessity which we cannot avoid. In other words, Calvin is saying all the weaknesses that we find ourselves trapped in, our limitations, our pain, the things that cause us frustration, they're ours out of necessity. We can't escape that. We have no other choice. But Jesus, he chose them. He chose to set aside, to empty himself, and take on our experience. He chose to suffer. He chose to become a man. He chose to suffer as we suffer because he loves us. He chose to experience the weaknesses and the aches and the pains. He even chose to experience the cross for us. The only difference between us and him is we experience our weaknesses and pains necessarily. He experiences them voluntarily. He chose it. Let me try to illustrate this for you. What if you could choose your family? And you had two choices. Choice number one, perfect family, rich, beautiful, happy, healthy, loving, safe. Family number two, poor, broken, mean. Murderous. Which family do you choose? You see, Jesus chose option number two. He chose to become like us. So that one day we could become like him. He chose to become like you because he loves you, because he wants to save you. What a kid this Jesus is. With these two verses, Luke, he attempts to give us a glimpse into the humanity of Jesus Christ. Yes, the Gospels, God, Luke's Gospels, Matthew's Gospel, John's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, they all point us to the divinity of Christ. But Jesus was so human, it was hard for the people who grew up and interacted with him to believe that he was God. He was so human. This is the humanity of Christ. Let's talk about the wisdom of Christ from this passage. 
the wisdom of Christ. Look at verse 46. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. I got a question for you guys. Where did Jesus get this wisdom? Where did he get this understanding? Where did he get these answers that impressed these trained scholarly men? Where'd he get it? He learned it. This point piggybacks off of our first point, but I want to emphasize that spiritual wisdom, that intimate knowledge of God, that intimate knowledge of the scriptures like Jesus possessed, it comes through the disciplined life. Discipline in the word, discipline in prayer, discipline in pursuing God, seeking first his kingdom, his righteousness, knowing that all these other things will be added to us. This is why God calls us in 1 Timothy chapter 4 to pursue discipline. He tells us in verse 7 there in chapter 4, 1 Timothy 4, 7, discipline yourselves for the purpose of godliness. Sure, bodily discipline is of some profit, some valuable. We don't throw out bodily discipline. But discipline for the purpose of godliness, that's valuable both now in this life and the life to come. Listen, if we miss the fact that Jesus, as he grew, did not live this disciplined life in his pursuit of holiness, in the pursuit of his father, then we're lying to ourselves. Look back at verse 40. It says, and the child grew and became strong, filled. See that word filled? Filled with wisdom. The English word filled is here in the past tense. And that could mislead us into thinking that Jesus was at some point filled, that he did get to tap into God like we can tap into a computer and just download all of this information and he didn't have to work for it. It was just somehow given to him or downloaded or dumped into him. But that's not Luke's point here. Pook, Luke, sorry about that, Luke, he doesn't use an aorist or a past tense verb denoting a point of action that just happened. What he uses here is a present passive participle. Present means that it kept going. Participle meant that it kept going. It was a continuous action. And the fact that it was passive meant that Jesus was being acted on. He was continually being filled by an outside source. And what was the outside source? Well, it was God through his holy word. The same way he fills us with wisdom. God through his holy word. Jesus possessed a discipline that enabled him by the time he was 12 years old to, imple- to impress the doctors of philosophy, if you will, who sat in the temple courts. The discipline of Ezra comes to mind. You'll remember Ezra, Ezra 7.10, that Ezra had set his heart to the study of the law or the word of God and to keep it and to teach its decrees to all of Israel. In this way, Ezra and his discipline points us to the discipline of Christ who set his heart to the study of the scriptures so he could practice it, live it out, obey it, and then teach its laws and decrees to Israel. You see, Jesus as a boy, he sought for God like Captain Ahab sought after the great white whale. Relentlessly, passionately, seriously. It's an overused metaphor, but he was like a sponge just soaking in the word of God. Can you imagine Jesus as a boy, listening, reading, hearing, 
the words of God. It's just like two pieces of puzzle that just fit perfectly. Jesus, the Son of God, and the Son of Man, what it must have been like when he heard the Proverbs. Hear, my son. Hear, my son, your father's instruction. For they are a graceful garland for your head and a pendant for around your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Jesus soaking it in. Yes. Yes, father. My son, if you receive my words and you treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight, if you raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver, as as if it were hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. For the Lord, who gives wisdom? For the Lord gives wisdom. Wisdom. Where did Jesus get his wisdom? For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Listen, when Jesus heard the words, when the rabbis would teach, when his mom and dad would do family worship, when he had the chance to open the scrolls and read them for himself, Jesus, the perfect son of God, he would never let the word of God fall to the floor. He would never, he would never waste those opportunities. He didn't disregard them as if they were optional for his life. He soaked them up. And as a 12-year-old boy, people were amazed. How did Jesus respond to the word? How did he respond? Well, I believe Psalm 119 gives us a pretty accurate picture. Let me just read one paragraph to you from Psalm 119. How did Jesus respond to the word? With my whole heart, I seek you, O God. Do not let me wander away from your commandments. I've stored up in my heart. I've treasured in my heart your word so that way I will not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me. Teach me your statutes. In the way of your testimonies, I delight. I relish as much as all riches. I will meditate. I will Think, I will work hard and think on your precepts. I will not forget your words. Oh God, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your word, from your law, that I might not sin against you. I am a sojourner on earth. Hide not your commandments from me. Verse 20, my soul is consumed with longing for your word. Church, if that doesn't point us to Christ, let's just, that points us to Christ. Marvel at the wisdom of this 12-year-old boy. Just as the shepherds and the magi fell down before him as a baby and worship, so too everyone who was alive at this time could fall down and worship him as a 12-year-old boy. This truly is the God-man. Marvel at this 12-year-old boy's wisdom and knowledge. It was amazing. Look at verse 42. All who heard him were amazed. They were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Listen, 
young people especially, Jesus didn't take his childhood off. He didn't think someday he was going to get serious with his relationship with God. Now they're just going to, yeah, I'll just take a free pass right now. I'm just a kid. It doesn't matter. That's not how Jesus pursued God at all. He never settled. He worked hard. He wasn't given a free pass. He was consumed, consumed with his longing for the word of God at all times. Church, this is the wisdom of Christ, even as a boy, as he is found here in Luke chapter 2. It's at this point where I have to go to God. <laughs> And say, God, I do not measure up. I mean, I sit there and I look at Jesus. I hear about Christ as a boy. And I think to myself, as a 42-year-old man, if I could only live like that. Praise God for the doctrine of imputation. Of course, the doctrine of imputation tells us that for all those who trust in Christ, who turn from their unbelief in sin and turn to Christ, that Christ is imputes that he gives us his perfection so that when God looks at me he doesn't see me as the screw up that I am at 42 year old he doesn't he didn't see me as the screw up 16 year old he didn't see me as a screw up 13 year old instead he saw the perfection of Christ when he looked at me because Christ gave it to me it's mine by faith and it can be yours by faith but imputation not only tells us that his righteousness, that his perfection is given to us, it also tells us that everything we've done wrong, all our failings, all our sins, he takes them from us and he nails them to himself on the cross and he pays them in full. It's called our certificate of debt in Colossians chapter 2. In other words, he imputes, he gives my sin to himself so that he could pay for it in full. Praise God, praise God that this perfect Jesus, who even as a boy shames me because of his perfection, at the same time causes me to rejoice because it's that very perfect perfection that he gives to me that is mine and can be yours through faith in him. So yes, let us be thankful for the perfection of Christ even, even as he grew up as a boy. This morning, I also want to say that I am very encouraged and inspired by the life and discipline of Christ. It's incredibly inspiring to know that Jesus did not get some free pass, had an easy life, was able to download all that wisdom and knowledge and never had to work for it. He possessed it all, but it's because he devoted himself to it. That's why he grew. That's why he learned. That's why he was filled with wisdom. And so while Christ's perfection, his discipline, while it does convict me, it also challenges me. It inspires me to be like him. After all, that is why God called us, right? According to Romans chapter 8, verse 29, that we would be conformed to the image of his son. Not in his divinity, he alone is God. To be conformed to Christ in his humanity man how incredible is it to think that every time Jesus had the choice to either pursue God or whatever excuse was out there he always chose to pursue God oh Jesus make us more like you. 
to be like Christ. So church, once again, let us look to Christ. Let us marvel at his incredible life from beginning to end. Let us trust in his work and his love for us. Let us trust in his imputation. Let us be inspired, though, at the same time to follow in his steps, to be methetes, to be disciples of Christ. Let's pray.